Hey everyone, um, this is your voiceover for hematology. So we're going to take a, like a really deep dive into the study of blood. We're going to take a look at some different red blood cells, um, you know, see how red blood cells work in our body. Also white blood cells, platelets, all the different types of blood cells and how they interact within our bodies. And especially what happens when we don't either have enough of them or have a destruction of them or a patient has some sort of disease process where it is affecting um, the hematological process. Um, so we'll get into that. Um, here are your readings. You can take a look at a few places just to look back on. Lewis, there's chapter um, 29 and chapter 30. Also, Craven has chapter 22 and ATI a little bit in chapter 39, um, if you wanted to just take a look back. So bunch of questions, bunch of questions. Um, so where does, you know, where does blood cell production occur? I'll have you think about all these questions for a few seconds. But blood, blood cell production occurs in the bone marrow. Um, and that, if you remember just from A&P, the bone marrow is that soft material that fills the core of our bones. What are the two types? They're meaning two types of bone marrow. This is going way back to A&P. And that would be yellow bone marrow, and that's made up of a lot of fat. And then there's the red bone marrow, and that's really the one that actively makes our red blood cells. What are the three types of blood cells? And we're going to say there's going to be red blood cells, there's white blood cells, and then there's platelets. So those are the three main types of blood cells, and we're going to really hone in on those today. And do you know where they develop or remember from A&P where the red blood cells develop, white blood cells develop, and platelets? And you're close if you say within the red bone, mar bone, red bone marrow, you're absolutely correct. But it's actually within the stem cells within the red bone marrow. So a little bit deeper, deeper dive into the red marrow. You're not wrong. They do get developed within the red bone marrow, but within the stem cells within the red bone marrow. How do you think our bodies know that we need to make blood cells? What do you think? Our bodies are pretty smart. So if they kind of pick up on a, they notice that our body is lacking in some sort of blood cell, um, it kind of gives a feedback system to the bone marrow, meaning that bone marrow is going to pick up a little bit of production for whatever reason or another that it's picking up why we don't have enough, whether it's picking up that we may have an anemia issue, do we have some tissue hypoxia issue, um, are, is our body picking up an infection and it's going to make a little bit more white blood cells. So our, our bone marrow is very, very sensitive and it's going to produce what is needed for our body and our bodies are smart like this. So due to the sensitivity and picking up that it's noticing that we're lacking a red blood cell, we're lacking a white blood cell, or we're lacking some platelets, it's going to try to develop more. So what hormone helps the production of red blo um, blood cells? And that is erythropoietin. That is erythropoietin, that is a hormone. It's actually originally released from the kidneys, and then it helps stimulate the bone marrow, and that's the hormone stimulating hormone that affects our bone marrow. And I answered this question for you. What organ does this come from? So the kidneys. The, the kidneys are going to pick up on the lack of, you know, especially red blood cell. Is the kidneys picking up that there's some sort of anemia going on? Is the kidneys picking up that we have some poor oxygen perfusion? So that's going to secrete erythropoietin and it's going to circulate right to the bone marrow. All right, I'll, a few more questions. Not quite done yet, but what are the two major components of blood? And that is actually going to be blood cells itself. So there's going to be blood cells, and then there's actually a portion of your blood that is plasma. <clears throat> like, give or take, thinking about an average, close to average size person, let's say, you know, 170, 180 pound person, there's about six quarts of blood or really meaning five and a half liters. So if you're looking at, you know, liters of soda, there's going to be five and a half of them. 
um, that's really how much blood is within a typical um, adult. About 55% of that is plasma, so there's a lot of plasma, and about you know, the other 45% is the blood cells, meaning blood cells mean red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, you know, those three types of blood cells that you told me about already. Um, what is plasma composed of? And that's going to be composed of proteins. It's composed of a lot of different things. Proteins, electrolytes, glucose, lipids, albumin, some clotting factors. And do you know where this plasma is produced? And especially what should ring a bell if there's clotting factors going on, what organ really manages our clotting factors, our coagulopathies? And that's going to be the liver. So our liver, that organ produces plasma proteins. And you already told me a lot already, the three types of blood cells. We know that's red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. <clears throat> but what are those three fun functions? Like, think about it. What is the function of the red blood cell? Its main function, really. And it's really, really important for oxygen transportation, okay? That is the real big gist of, of um, red blood cells. Travel throughout our body, every organ, and it creates an oxygen transport and helps perfusion. How about white blood cells? They're hopefully protecting our body from infection. That's, that's the main function of the white blood cell. And platelets, they're going to help promote blood coagulation, okay? So they're going to help clotting, okay? They're going to help prevent us from, you know, bleeding out or bleeding too much. All right, and this is just kind of a continuation of what we talked about on the previous slide, just a more visual breakdown of the blood. And like we mentioned, we got plasma and we got blood cells, and you can see that in this blood tube. So there's 55% plasma which again, a little bit of proteins, about 7%, which the big one is albumin, a lot of water. And then there's some clotting factors as well, fibrinogen, not that much. And then actually some nutrients too, um, some ions, nutrients, not much of that either, only about 2%. And then when we look at the other part of blood, which is our blood cells, it's going to break it down into what we termed platelets. This is a fancy name, leukocytes, medical term for white blood cell. And then erythrocytes is that fancy term for red blood cell. So leukocyte is a, a white blood cell. Erythrocyte is the red blood cells. And you can see that's over 99%. So a lot of the red blood cells in the blood itself. A little bit of platelets and a little bit of white blood cells. You can see the leukocytes are broken down to even you know, more categories, neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils, those all have to do with the, the white blood cells. All right, so we're going to get into functions of the blood and understand why blood's so important. So it's here to protect us, it's here to help regulate, and it's yeah, here to transport, and that's another part. All of these are very important. So with protection, it's going to hopefully maintain coagulation. You know, we are have the clotting factors within the blood itself, and you saw that within the breakdown of the blood tube. So maintaining coagulation, making sure we don't clot our blood too much or we don't bleed too much. So we want to have that nice um, equilibrium of clotting factors. Also combating invasion of pathogens, protection. Our white blood cells are, you know, that's a big deal for them. They're our, um, they're our army for our body. So with regulation, it's our blood helps regulate fluid and electrolyte balances. Also acid-base balances um, helps regulate our body temperatures and helps maintain, um, what's really important, really meaning our blood pressure, maintaining intravascular volume and pressure, meaning it's giving our, our vessels plumpness to maintain our blood pressure. In transportation, so, so important. This is our perfusion. So our red blood cells are especially important for oxygen delivery to all of our tissues, all of our vital organs. Um, also delivers nutrients from the GI tract to cells. Um, hormone transportation and also transports metabolic waste. 
All right, so when we're doing a focused hematological assessment, um, there's some things we would probably want to look for and keep in mind. Um, always taking a look at the patient's stool and asking them, have they noticed that they've had any black tarry stools, blood in their stool, um, really even blood in their urine or what we would call hematuria. Um, same thing with emesis or, you know, vomit, blood in the vomit. Um, is it more lymphatic? Do we have some swelling in the neck? armpits, groin area, to mean that there's some sort of infection, um, something off with the white blood cells. We talked about hematuria. Um, really questioning the patient, you know, have they had recent fatigue, uh, any heart palpitations, they feel any short of breath, and have they had any unusual bleeding or bruising? So, you know, things, what can we check for as a nurse? You know, um, what are some other things? How's their blood pressure, right? Do they have a, you know, a very soft, low blood pressure on the lower side? That would be a little bit concerning, meaning that we don't have that nice plumpness to our vasculature. Um, so it's not going to keep our blood pressure up as well if something's lacking within our blood. Um, how's their pulse? Um, if their blood is a little bit lower, we would can, you know, we would monitor that and make sure that they're not tachycardic or their heart rate isn't high. <clears throat> Do we notice any liver or spleen enlargement with pal you know with palpation? Again, how are their lymph nodes? Swelling in the neck, armpits, groin, checking their skin for bruising, lesions, any color changes. Um, and then really most importantly is taking a look at diagnostics and really getting lab values. And we're gonna get into labs in a little bit. But that, you know, complete blood count, also known as a CBC. That's going to be your most important lab draw. It's going to take a look at that hemoglobin and hematocrit, which we'll talk about, also known as their H and H. It'll give us the white blood cells. Um, it also will give us a little bit more of a breakdown, you know, what we saw with the monocytes, the leukocytes, the um, eosinophils, basophils. It's going to have, take a look at the platelets. How's our clotting factors? Okay, so now we get to take a look at our normal lab values. And again, this is our complete blood count and really the important things that you wanna hone in on your CBC. So here we are, H and H. So hemoglobin is the first part of your H, also HGB. Um, this, is, this measures gas carrying capacity of the red blood cell, okay? So if there's low levels, it may signify anemia, low iron in the diet, and really less blood internally, meaning there's some sort of a bleed. Or if these levels are too high, which we don't typically see a lot, but that could mean, you know, there's an overproduction of red blood cells for some reason, maybe a cancerous um, disease process, could be heart, lung, liver disease, um, and even possible dehydration. Because if you think about it, if you, you know, a lot of our our fluid and water is in our plasma. And if that's gone, what's left is a lot of the blood cells. So that's gonna actually be higher if we don't have enough fluid. In females, it's 12 to 16. And in males, it's 14 to 18. And then when we, we're gonna move on to hematocrit. And this is a percentage of total blood volume, okay? Measure of packed cell volume of red blood cells. So in females, this is 37 to 47%, and males a little higher, 42 to 52. And, you know, same reasons, whether it be high or low, um, is the same, pretty much the same for hematocrit as well. Um, and then we're going to talk about total red blood cell count, where, you know, total erythrocyte count. So your red blood cells, meaning the number of circulating red blood cells per volume of blood. And for females, that's 4.2 to 5.4, and males, 4.7 to 6.1. And again, low on the low end, that would signify any anemias, you know, low vitamins, especially like B6, B12, malnutrition, and, and any internal blood loss. White blood cell count, that's your total number of white blood cells, and that's typically 5,000 to 10,000. And... <clears throat> We may see definitely lower levels if a pa patient has is undergoing any cancer treatment, if there's been any bone marrow suppression or any types of leukemia. Um, high levels, of course, are associated with more so like infection, inflammation, um, 
any injury or sometimes cancers can cause an increase in white blood cells as well. And platelet count, this is the number of platelets circulating. And that's this is typically 150,000 to 400,000. And if, if it's noting low on the low end, the patient is definitely at risk for bleeding if it's reading below 150,000. And then above 400,000, the patient's at a lot a major risk for cl developing clots. And then we're going to talk quickly about clotting studies. So this would be our, you know, coagulation. Um, this is a different type of blood draw, and this is noted under your coags. So when you go under labs, this would be coag studies. And these are all our normal values. So um, we have our partial thromboblastin time, or also known as PTT, and the normal is 30 to 40 seconds. So this is a, assesses the intrinsic coagulation factors, and it helps evaluate the person's ability to clot. Um, and the most important part of this is this is actually a lab test that's going to help monitor patients that are on a heparin drip. <clears throat> so low end, so low PTTs means blood is clotting faster than normal, and high PTTs mean is blood is clotting slower than normal or not clotting quick enough. Um, next that you'll see often in your career is a D-dimer. Um, this actually measures fragments of fibrin strands meaning that there is actually clots developing within the body and whenever there is clots in the body it sheds fibrin strands so what this d-dimer is picking up is the fibrin strands that are being shedded okay that are being shed i should say um if you know the clots degregate they break down so what we like to see for a d-dimer is less than 250 anything above 250 it means that there's they're picking up a little bit more fibrin strands meaning there's a possible DVT or PE risk. Next is fibrinogen, and this reflects the level of fibrinogen in the body, kind of similar to a D-dimer. Um, <clears throat> the normal is 200 to 400, and if levels show more so above the 400, there's possible clots within the patient, and the patient is definitely in a hypercoagulable state. Um, if fibrinogen is low, low than, lower than 200, they're definitely more predisposed to bleeding. INR, International Normalized Ratio, and it's gonna tell you how long it's going to take for your blood to clot, okay? This is typically used a lot in patients who are receiving Coumadin or Warfarin, um, and the normal is 0.8 to 1.1, I know patients on Coumadin have specific therapeutic levels that the provider wants them to reach, but typically lower levels mean they're at risk for clotting, higher levels of INR means they are at risk for bleeding. So typically these patients who are on Coumadin or Warfarin get about weekly blood draws just to make sure that they're, they're um, on their therapeutic level. If not, they would have to change the doses, dosage of the Coumadin. And then next we have our PT, also known as our prothrombin time, and that's 11 to 12.5 seconds. And this is the amount of time it takes for the plasma portion of our, of our body to clot. So the plasma portion of our blood to clot. How long does that take? And then next is, lastly, is platelets. And our normal is 150 to 400,000. <clears throat> and it gives us the number of circulating platelets in our body. And below 150,000 means we're more at risk for bleeding. And the higher we go, if we're above 400,000, we're more at risk for developing clots. So it's just good to get a breakdown of what the normals mean, what everything means within the COAG studies, what everything means within your CBC studies. And then we're gonna take a look at just some medical terms you're, you're going to hear in clinical throughout your practice and something good to get used to. So we know white, white blood cells are leukocytes. So if we're thinking either high or low, if we have a low white blood cell count, that would be considered a leukopenia. If we have a high white blood cell count, that's going to be considered a leukocytosis. So you're gonna hear these terms mentioned often. Next, we're going to go on to, we know erythrocyte means red blood cell. 
<clears throat> and polycythemia. So if we're talking polycythemia, it means that we have high levels of a red blood cell, hemoglobin, and hematocrit. And then when we're talking about the entire blood cell, so we talked about red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, so those three main components of blood. If the entirety is suppressed for some reason or another, red blood cell, white blood cell, and platelet, that's called pancytopenia. So anything with like kind of penia in it means that it's low. Thrombocytopenia. So, okay, penia probably is going to mean low, but what are we talking about here? Thrombocyte. And that's going to be our platelet. So we're meaning we have a low platelet count. Again, meaning at risk for bleeding. And then if we have high platelets or a thrombocytosis, almost like an erythrocytosis, right? Um, that's going to mean high platelets. So too many platelets, meaning we're probably going to have excessive clotting. So we're going to get into, we're talking about anemias a lot, okay? So we went over a little A and P, did a little reminder of the red blood cell, kind of got down to our medical terminology, um, looked at the normal readings of what should be normal for male and female. And what is anemia? <clears throat> so anemia is a deficiency in the amount of red blood cells, hemoglobin and hematocrit. So it can, it can all be to entwined. It could be maybe just the H and H. Um, but there is a problem with either a decrease in red blood cell production. There's going to be maybe blood loss or an increase in right red blood cell destruction, okay? So there's some reasons why anemias can occur, and we're going to go through that. But if we're low, I mean, what does what do red blood cells transport? And we went over this a little bit already, but you know they transport oxygen, meaning that's, that's how we perfuse. So if we're anemic in any sort of manner, um, whether it be from a decrease in red blood cell production in our marrow, acute blood loss, um, or red blood cells are being destroyed, we're going to have a decrease in oxygen consumption. Um, so that's a big deal because it decreases our oxygenation, decreases our perfusion, meaning our, meaning our tissues can become hypoxic. Um, how is anemia diagnosed? <clears throat> Not only are we getting a good H and P, we're assessing the patient, um, and we're going to go over things of what to look at. But remember, we already discussed. We're going to look at the urine. Are they fatigued? We're going to look at the stool. Um, how is their oxygen? How is their vital signs? Is their blood pressure low? Is their heart rate higher? Um, we can. We'll do a further diagnostic and take a look at the labs we just went over. So we'll do that complete blood count. How's our red blood cells looking? How's the H and H looking? Um, so it's going to help us determine a little bit further of what's going on. So anemia can be a result from like a primary hematologic issue, or it can develop secondary from other disease in the, in, in the body, like kidney failure, liver dysfunction. Um, so there can be many reasons why we are losing blood. I just wanted to go over quickly um, what a red blood cell may look like if there's something wrong with it or you know if there's a normal red blood cell so we're going to take a look if we, if we looked at a red blood cell under a microscope this is what you know we may see so the first type of red blood cell it's called normal cytic or normal chromic so this is a normal size blood cell it's normal in color um, we see these a lot in just acute blood loss itself um, if there was any hemolysis, so meaning that our red blood cell is being destructed for some reason or broken down, um, we can see normal cytic cells in chronic kidney disease, different cancers, endocrine disorders, um, sickle cell, pregnancy. And what we're going to be talking about in these next few slides is the mean corpuscular volume, or MVC, meaning it's the average size of the red blood cell. And the average size, this is going to be normal for normal cytic. So 80 to 95 is normal. Um, so yes, we do still see normal red blood cells in 
in um, medical issues. Next, microcytic or hypochromic, meaning if you think of micro, it's going to be small, so small size red blood cell. And with micro, they're going to be pale looking in color. So it's not going to be that nice beefy red color we think of a, in a red, with a red blood cell. Um, it's going to be pale in color. We see this a lot with iron deficiency anemia, the microcytic cells. We see this a lot with vitamin B6 deficiency, any copper deficiency, thalassemia, lead poisoning, and that mean corpuscular volume, meaning again, that's the average size of the red blood cell is going to be low, so less than 80. And lastly, there is microcytic cells or megaloblastic cells. So these are, if you think of macro, is going to be large. So it's going to be a large cell. It's going to be normal in color. So the only one that's off in color is the microcytic. Um, we see the macrocytic cells a lot in vitamin B12 deficiency, um, folic acid deficiency, and liver disease. And their mean corpuscular volume is high, over 95%. So meaning they're big. And here's just the you know, the best picture I could find online to, you know, make a difference between each type of cell. So if we see at the top left, we have a normal red blood cell. The mean corpuscular volume is 80 to 100, which we like, but there's a lot of them, okay? There's not, there's not a lessening amount. Where we go to the normal cytic means that these cells don't change at all. The mean corpuscular volume isn't going to change. But we still see this in certain disease process. And of course, there's not going to be as much cells because there's some sort of anemia going on. We go to microcytic, meaning micro small, mean corpuscular volume is less than 80, and they're pale in color. And then macrocytic is large, so mean corpuscular volume more than 100, and they're, they're large cells. All right. So pretty much reasons of why we have decreased red, red blood cell production. Um, <clears throat> we could have deficient nutrients. So things could be as easy as fixing your diet. So iron, we can have a deficiency in iron. We could have a deficiency in folic acid or even vitamin B12. Um, we could have, for some reason, a decrease in that hormone or the erythropoietin. And remember, that's made in the kidneys. Um, so for some reason, it's not being stimulated. Most likely probably a chronic kidney disease. We don't see the erythropoietin probably stimulated as much, right? If there's something wrong with our kidneys. Um, decrease in iron availability or some iron deficiency, which we talked about in the nutrients. Some medications can cause decreased red blood cell production, maybe chemicals, radiation, or chemotherapy. Um, some leukemias. And then we're going to talk about blood loss in general, and we're going to get a little more into that in, in a little bit. But there's acute blood loss, meaning that it's it's not it hasn't been happening over a significant amount of time. So acutely, we can have a blood vessel rupture, a lot of times aortic aneurysm, um, GI bleeding. Is there a trauma? The patient hemorrhaging, pregnancy. <clears throat> and chronic, meaning it's happening over more of a lengthy amount of time. So like a gastritis, so any GI bleeding, a bleeding ulcer, um, liver disease, any menstrual flow problems can be chronic, hemorrhoids. And then there we're going to go over reasons of why red blood cells can actually be destroyed. So remember, I've mentioned the term a lot, hemolysis and destruction of red blood cells. Um, <clears throat> there are significant um, types of diseases that can actually cause our red blood cells to be destroyed within our body. So hemoly hemolysis itself, um, meaning it's our red blood cells are being just destroyed. A lot of times when there's a large cell, like the macrocytic cells, they're very easily broken down and destroyed. Even though they're big, they're very fragile, so they can get broken down very easily. Um, we see this with sickle cell disease. Um, any incompatible blood transfusions can actually cause the red blood cell destruction. Um, toxins, um, like malaria. DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation can cause a red blood cell destruction, meaning that we're in significant liver failure and 
our coagulopathies are not working well. Um, so we can actually have a large amount of bleeding because of DIC. HELP syndrome um, during pregnancy. Um, this is definitely like a, a hypertension issue during pregnancy, has a lot to do with liver, um, causes destruction of red blood cells and rides, widespread cancer. So this slide's very important. It's, it's, we're always gonna kind of go back to these generalized signs and symptoms. So in the next few slides, we're gonna be talking about different anemias. And with a lot of them, they're all gonna kind of come back to these generalized anemic symptoms. So this is a good slide to just kind of highlight to always just go back to on our generalized symptoms for anemia. If we're looking at numbers, so if we were to take a CBC, we would notice that you know a mild anemia, our hemoglobin would be maybe 10 to 12, which still isn't horrible, really. Um, a moderate anemia would be a hemoglobin 6 to 10. Um, 6 is getting into the scary range, and severe, of course, is less than 6. Um, so manifestations are really caused by the body's response to tissue hypoxia. So say mild anemia, our patients may not even be symptomatic, right? Um, so symptoms probably will progress as, as our levels progress and our, our blood cell production becomes less and less. Um, hemoglobin is often used, as you notice, we're only looking at hemoglobin here. Hemoglobin is really, really our main number that's used to determine the severity of anemia. So we're going to go through our system. So if we're going to assess a patient cardiac wise, we're going to notice they're probably going to have palpitations, meaning when we have a decrease in blood, blood cells, our heart's going to probably work a little harder, right? So palpitations, we're going to be tachycardic. Um, we may notice some dysrhythmias depending on how severe our levels are. Possible heart murmur, chest pain, and uh, this can actually, because of the trauma and the workload putting on the heart due to the decreased vascularization, we can, we can possibly have an MI. Um, also, we will most likely notice a decrease in blood pressure. Okay, blood pressure will be low. Neuro, um, patient may complain of a headache, um, dizziness or vertigo, some irritability, possible impaired thought process. Think about it. If we're not getting enough oxygen to our brain, do you think we're going to be thinking as well? We're not getting that nice oxygen delivery. Our brain is the most sensitive organ to oxygen consumption and the patient may present as lethargic. Um, pulmonary, these patients get tired out really quickly. Um, so it, there may be any exertional dyspnea, you know, if they're trying to exercise or move around, they're gonna be pretty tired and maybe even short of breath. Depending on how severe, they can actually have shortness of breath at rest and they could, you know, have high respiratory rates or be tachypneic. And again, this is all due to oxygen perfusion. Everything kind of leads down to that perfusion, okay? I can't stress this enough. Um, musculoskeletal, we'll have muscle fatigue. Yeah, if we're not getting that good oxygen to our muscles and tissues, do you think they're gonna move as well or feel as good when we're moving? Nope. And skin, patients will look pale possible jaundice, especially, you know, when there's red blood cell breakdown or hemolysis, the breakdown actually gets concentrated within the liver and may, our bili, bilirubin levels may rise due to the destruction of red blood cells. So a patient can actually appear jaundice if there's a significant amount of hemolysis and blood cell breakdown. And um, puritis, meaning itching. What do we do as nurses? Okay, we're going to correct the underlying cause. We need to figure out why the bleeding is happening. Why are they anemic? Is there an acute blood loss? Is there a chronic blood loss? Is there some sort of anemic process going on? Are they going to need a blood transfusion? Um, is there a decrease in erythropoietin? Are they um, a kidney, chronic kidney patient that may need erythropoietin drug therapy? Um, to stimulate the bone marrow? 
Are we deficient in vitamins or supplements, meaning iron or vitamin B12? Um, we may need to just give them some oxygen therapy until they get over the hump. If we're not getting correct oxygen through our blood cells, we need to, you know, help the patient out somehow. So we're going to give them oxygen. Helping the patient just making dietary and lifestyle changes, if, especially if it's more of a diet relation and encouraging just rest and activity. We don't want these patients to be completely immobile. We want them to be moving around, but having that adequate rest and activity, prioritize activities. So the first anemia we're gonna talk about today is iron deficiency anemia. Um, this is actually our most common nutritional disorder in the world. We see this a lot with young women, childbearing ages, and patients who may have poor diets or inadequate dietary intake. Um, we also see this a lot with any malabsorption syndromes, especially if patients have had multiple like GI surgeries. Um, it may occur after a certain type of GI surgeries, um, especially if it had any, any location within the duodenum. Um, we see this, you know, blood loss, GI blood loss um, with peptic ulcers, um, we see gastritis, esophagitis, diverticulitis, hemorrhoids, and cancer. And if we were to look, you know, at the patient's stool, it may look as black and tarry. You need about 50 to 75 mLs of blood loss to make stool have that look to it. Could be hemolysis, so we could have destruction of red blood cells for some reason. Um, again, menstruation. You would need about 45 mLs of blood loss per month. And actually any patients who have chronic kidney disease and dialysis treatment, we see a lot of iron deficiency. We see blood loss a lot through the equipment and blood sampling. So how a patient may present with iron deficiency anemia. Um, Again, going back to those general manifestations we went over on that previous slide. Remember, we went through all the systems there. So they probably have a lot of those signs and symptoms. Um, there's a little more um, to add for iron deficiency. So again, pa being pallor is the most common finding for iron deficiency, and that is noted in that slide. Um, they could have glossitis, meaning there's inflammation of the tongue. And a lot of times this is the second most common symptom we see with iron deficiency. Um, and also shilitis, meaning there's inflammation of the lips. Patient may present with a headache, um, paresthesia, meaning that they have like pins and needle feelings in their extremities, and then also a burning sensation of the tongue. So for diagnostics, of course, you'd be doing your, you know, H&P, history and physical, kind of getting down to the bottom of what is causing the iron deficiency anemia, um, going through all those um, clinical manifestations that we mentioned, um, taking a look at the diagnostics, so looking at the lab values, what's their CBC look like, right? So within the CBC, we look at that hemoglobin and hematocrit. Yeah, we can look at the red blood cell, especially looking at the decreased iron level. That'll definitely clue us in there for that type of anemia. Um, any occult, occult blood in the stool. Um, possibly doing scopes, endoscopy, colonoscopy, to figure out if this is more of a, a chronic bleed, and if possible, a bone marrow biopsy may need to be done. So nursing care, of course, what's the underlying problem, right? Is it more nutrient deficient? Is this more from bleeding? Um, so figuring out the base of the problem. Um, and if needed, replacing iron, um, starting with it more in the diet. So iron is found in lean beef, um, turkey, pork, chicken, fish, legumes, dark green leafy veggies, whole grain bread, cereals, um, beans. If needed, we may need to give IM or IV iron sucrose. If anyone has given that before, it's a really, really dark brown color um, in an IV bag. Um, so that can be like a um, IV piggyback type of medication to be given. It could, and like I stated, also can be IM. PO by mouth, so iron sulfate given by mouth. Um, it should be taken about an hour before meals. 
And usually it really works best with taking it with some vitamin C, like even taking it with some orange juice. Um, iron is best absorbed in an acidic environment. Um, and we really need to avoid binding with food. So that vitamin C really enhances the iron absorption because of the acidity. It's important to have your patients, if they can, um, you know, dilute this. If it's liquid, liquid iron, this can be sipped through a straw. Um, again, this can stain the patient's teeth. So that's something important to keep in mind. The patient can have GI side effects, and a lot of times we do see constipation with taking an iron possible heartburn, so making sure they sit upright for at least 30 minutes after taking their medication. Um, it's normal for stools to appear green or black. Um, that's just what the iron will do. And really starting stool softeners for these patients um, just because of the, the risk of constipation. And if needed, they may, may need a blood transfusion, so packed red blood cell transfusion. <laughs> So that was iron deficiency. The next type of anemia is thalassemia. Um, and there's two types of thalassemias that we'll get into. One is a little, um, you know, more concerning than the other. And this happens when there's an inadequate production of normal hemoglobin, okay? So our bone marrow is not producing enough normal hemoglobin. Um, there's also a huge decrease in red blood cell production. So there's not there's minimal production going on, okay? Um, absent or reduced globulin protein. So what's going on? Hemolysis occurs due to destruction, okay? So there's our red blood cells are being destroyed within the bone marrow, um, and that's by like a phagocytosis. So almost our own cells are kind of eating our own red blood cells um, within our marrow. Um, we typically see this in more ethnic groups of origin within the Mediterranean Sea, Southeast Asia, um, the Middle East, India, Pakistan, um, China, Southern Russia, and Africa. So this is this is a genetic trait. So it, has, it definitely has an autosomal recessive gene. Um, there's two types of thalassemia. Um, there is the heterozygous and there's homozygous. Um, with heterozygous, meaning one, hetero, um, there's just one thalassemic gene and one normal gene. So this is noted as a thalassemia minor. Whereas in homozygous, meaning two, there's two thalassemic genes, meaning thalassemia major. And this is the more complicated of the two. Okay, so some clinical manifestations of the thalassemia anemias. Um, we're going to talk about thalassemia minor. So this one is often asymptomatic. Um, and this is, you know, more of a mild to a moderate anemia, and it's considered, if we're looking at it in a microscope at the cell, this would be a microcytic anemia, meaning small blood cell, right, and pale in color. Um, also, mild splenomegaly may be noted. So remember, um, what's going on is our body's fighting against itself, and we have uh, macrophages attacking our blood cells and our mo bone marrow. And that is causing a large amount of hemolysis and destruction of red blood cells. What our spleen does is it actually continuously tries to remove the broken down parts of the red blood cell. So you can think that your spleen is in major overdrive trying to remove all these damaged red blood cells. So it's going to become enlarged. Um, patients tend to have a bronze color of the skin uh, pigmentation. And then um, also there's bone marrow hyperplasia. So remember a few slides back, we talked about how our bodies are smart. It will detect low levels of maybe oxygen or low levels of blood cells. And our bone marrow is going to fight an overdrive to try to produce more. When our bone marrow fights an overdrive to produce a huge amount of more new cells, more new red blood cells, they unfortunately will um, come out immature. Um, when they're being made too quickly and too vigorously and too fast, these cells become immature. And unfortunately, these cells die off anyway when they're immature. And that causes bone marrow hyperplasia when your bone marrow is in, in overdrive. Next is thalassemia major. So this is more of the life-threatening anemia. <clears throat> and what's going on here is um, we're going to have physical and mental growth is typically slowed in this type of anemia. 
Um, patients tend to appear pale and jaundice. Um, and again, due to the hemolysis of red blood cells, that can also be affecting the liver. Large amounts of destruction of red blood cells, um, the liver is working too hard, too much in overdrive, increasing bilirubin levels, and in turn presenting with jaundice. Again, the general symptoms of anemia that I wanted you guys to always remind, remind yourselves to look back on that one slide with all the clinical manifestations. Those are all the general symptoms. Pronounced splenomegaly, and again, we know why that's happening. And then again, bone marrow hyperplasia. Um, thickening of the cranium and maxillary cavity is found in these type of patients and also lung disease and hypertension from the iron overload. So because also another thing about breakdown of red blood cells, it, there can be a lot of iron deposits. So large amounts of iron deposition or iron deposits can cause, can cause these types of symptoms. So labs, we'll see a decrease in H&H &H for sure if we take a look at the um, CBC. We'll see a huge increase in iron due to the iron deposits because of the breakdown of the red blood cell. And then we'll probably see an increase in bilirubin just because of the overdrive of the liver <clears throat> breaking down the, the destructed red blood cells as well. So nursing care, what are we going to do for these patients with thalassemia? Thalassemia minor really does not require treatment. Typically, the body adapts, adapts to the reduction of the red blood cells. Um, there's really no specific drug or diet therapies for treating thalassemia. And then thalassemia major, because it's more of a life-threatening anemia, we're going to see a little bit more nursing care here. So they can most certainly have packed red blood cell transfusions, um, depending on how low our H&H &H level is. And typically goal for these patients is a hemoglobin level of 10, at least. Um, because of the iron deposits and Re receiving huge iron overload, not only from possible many blood cell transfusions, but because of what's happening with the red blood cell breakdown, um, these patients need to go into like chelation therapy. They're chelating agents. Um, one is known as X-Jade and then the other is Ferroprox. So these can help reduce the amount of iron. And it seems that patients are living a lot longer with iron chelation therapies. Um, and also just receiving blood and blood transfusions. Possible need for a splenectomy, um, monitoring lever levels, um, heart functions, lung functions, just because of the iron deposits. There can be a stem cell transplant. It is very, very risky, um, but it, it can, that can ha help these patients. All right, next, moving on, we're going to talk about megaloblastic anemias, and there's two types of anemias that fall under megaloblastic. There's cobalamin deficiency, which is B12 deficiency, and folic acid deficiency. Um, what's going on here is that there is a, um, a DNA synthesis is impaired, and there is defective red blood cell maturation. Okay, it's not maturing well enough. So what's going on is there is large red blood cells being made. And, you know, if we remember when we took a look back at the picture of all these red blood cells, I mentioned that large red blood cells are fragile. You would think large ones would, would be stronger, but they're not. They're easily destroyed. They have fragile cell membranes. So there's an impaired DNA synthesis with the presence of large red blood cells, meaning these red blood cells are most likely immature because then they're going to die off and when they're large they die off as well macrocytic all right so the vitamin b12 deficiency cobalamin um, what's going on here is there is an absence of what's called an intrinsic factor and also it's known as if <clears throat> and this is the most common cause of any b12 deficiency and we see this a lot in what's called pernicious anemia um, this begins typically middle age or later, um, about 40, diagnosed by 60. And what's going on is there's um, our gastric mucosa secretes a protein called IF, okay, the intrinsic factor. 
<clears throat> and IF is required, the intrinsic factor is required for B12 absorption. But if there's a problem within the gastric mucosa and it's it doesn't have this intrinsic factor, do you think we're going to absorb the B12 as well? No, B12 will not be absorbed if we don't have this IF factor, intrinsic factor within our gastric mucosa. So we see this in pernicious anemia. The gastric mucosa isn't secreting the intrinsic factor that we need because that intrinsic factor is going to help absorb the B12. And we see this a lot with any mucosal atrophy in the GI tract, any autoimmune destruction, um, and actually destruction of the parietal cells, which is also seen in our GI cells. Um, there could be a decrease in hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Um, very similar to iron, we need a acidic environment. Um, an acidic gastric environment is also needed for intrinsic factor. So if we're having a decrease in acidity in our stomach for some reason or another, we are also not going to absorb B12. <clears throat> Deficiency can also occur in patients who've had gastric surgeries, um, gastric bypass, gastrectomies, any patients with Crohn's disease, celiac disease. We see this also a lot in patients um, with um, alcohol use disorder um, and smoking. So how are these patients going to present? We're going to look back at that slide and look at all of our general manifestations of anemia. Um, they typically also present with a sore, red, beefy, shiny tongue, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and anorexia, a lot of weakness, and that paresthesia, which is that pins and needles in our extremities, Impaired thought process, and that can range from a array of just confusion to severe dementia. A lot of manifestations are in relation to tissue hypoxia, okay? If we're not getting that perfusion, poor oxygenated blood, um, a lot of those manifestations will occur. If we're going to look at lab data, we're going to have to see a decrease in H&H, and, &H, and then we're going to see a decrease in B12. And diagnostics, of course, we would do that nice H&P, go to history and physical. Um, look at the CBC, how's the H&H &H look? How do our red blood cells look? How's the B12 look? Um, the red blood cells will, of course, appear large because they're macrocytic if we're looking at them under a microscope. Um, there can be a, a serum test done on um, anti-IF antibodies, so it can take a look at intrinsic factors within the gut mucosa and see what's going on there. Um, sometimes we can find that out if that's more of an autoimmune problem. Um, we can dig a little bit deeper to see that in the antibodies. Um, upper and lower GI scope, we can take a biopsy of the mucosa and also test that for intrinsic factor. And also there's serum methylmalonic acid and serum homocysteine. And these can actually help determine the cause and type of anemia that's going on. <clears throat> in nursing care for vitamin B12 deficiency, um, typically parenteral, parenteral, excuse me, vitamin B12 would be recommended, especially if there's an absorption problem or if the gastric mucosa is lacking the intrinsic factor. So if the IF is lacking or absorption in the GI tract is impaired, of course the patient will not be able to absorb that B12 regardless of how much is ingested or replaced. So um, parenteral is highly recommended due to that and due to the um, absorption issue. Um, intranasal B12 can be given. And then what is typically recommended, especially if patients are getting more IM B12? Um, I know I remember I given my grandmother B12 shots. Um, so the first um, two weeks, the patient is going to receive 1,000 mics per day IM. So every day they're going to get 1,000 mics. And then for the next week, until the hemoglobin is normal, and then it is given once a month. 
after that. So it's kind of like a titration process. So once a day for two weeks, then one time a week until hemoglobin is normal, and then it is given once per month. <clears throat> if GI absorption is intact, then they can take high doses of B12. It can be sublingual or oral. Um, we're going to help monitor these patients, right? Monitor and assist with any neuromuscular symptoms. Um, this can really affect the patient due to the B12 deficiency. So we're going to reduce any injury, um, decrease sensitivity to heat and pain. We're going to reduce that type of injury, protecting from falls, burns, traumas, especially with that paresthesia, right? That numbness and tingling, they don't have the greatest sensation going on. Also an increase in, in diet. So increase intake in meats, eggs, and rich grains, milk, dairy, and salmon helps a lot with B12. But if patients do not get that B12 replacement, um, they, they can have a high mortality rate and die within one to three years. Um, next, we're gonna talk about the folic acid deficiency. Um, we see this again a lot, not only with B12 with the um, alcohol use disorder, but we see this with folic acid deficiency as well. So chronic alcohol use, um, we see this also with patients who are chronically on dialysis. They lose a lot of that folic acid. Any dietary deficiencies if they're not getting enough folic acid in their diet. Um, and there's also drugs that interfere with absorption. So if they're, a patient is on methotrexate, I know that is typically used for patients who have rheumatoid arthritis, sometimes lupus, um, that can interfere with the absorption of folic acid. And also many anti-seizure medications like Keppra um, can interfere with absorption of folic acid. Also patients may have malabsorption syndromes like celiac Crohn's, small bowel resections. Um, folic acid is really needed for DNA synthesis, which, which in turn leads to red blood cell formation and maturation. So everything ties together, okay? How do these patients present clinical manifestations? Again, very similar to those of the cobalamin um, deficiency, B12 deficiency. Many symptoms can be attributed to the like pre-existing problem that is causing folic acid deficiency. Um, patients that are going through, you know, um, liver disease, cirrhosis, um, those symptoms are also there. Esophageal varices for patients with alcohol use disorder. Um, shilosis, which is, you know, is that um, inflammation of the lips, dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, flatulence and diarrhea, and neurosymptoms as well, probably has that paresthesia with the pins and needles. Um, if we're to take a look at labs, most like everything else, we're going to see that decrease in hemoglobin and hematocrit. Also, decrease in folate levels is going to clue us into this, and we're going to see a normal B12, and that's probably what's going to help determine the two differences. You know, is this more of a cobalamin type of issue? Is this more of a um, folic acid issue? And nursing. So we're going to do replacement therapy. We're going to replace folic acid, and typically these patients get one milligram per day by mouth. And if a patient, if they're more of a chronic ETOH or if they have alcohol use disorder um, or even malabsorption issues, um, that we're going to increase this dose to five milligrams a day. So that's going to be a little bit different. That sets apart patients just from the one milligram. Also, intake, um, increasing dietary intake of green leafy vegetables, enriched greens, some orange juice, peanuts, and avocados. And then we're moving on to anemias of chronic disease, and that's typically what this, the title means. So it's it's going to be from a patient has a, another chronic disorder which is causing anemia. So we see this a lot in cancer disorders, any autoimmune diseases, chronic kidney disease is a huge one, um, HIV, hepatitis. And this is also known as anemia of inflammation. So anemia of chronic disease or anemia of inflammation. 
<clears throat> so there's bleeding disorders in relation to these chronic diseases. It contributes to the anemia. So it's coming from a pre-existing problem. And what's going on here is there's underproduction of red blood cells and a shortened survival span. So we have a reduced red blood cell lifespan. We also have su suppressed production of erythropoietin, especially if we have a kidney disease. And we're gonna have, of course, an effective bone marrow response to the erythropoietin because we're not gonna have that hormone circulating and our bone marrow isn't gonna work correctly either. So we're gonna have definitely an underproduction of red blood cells, they're just not gonna be producing. This anemia is typically mild. Um, really, we need to treat the underlying disorders to fix this type of anemia a lot of the times. And it develops after one to two months of, of the disease, we typically see some signs of anemia going on. And the main cause is the cytokine dysregulation. And again, the cytokine dysregulation is causing a reduced red blood cell lifespan. That's what's going on. And that cytokine dysregulation is suppressing the production of erythropoietin along with chronic kidney disease, um, and it's affecting our bone marrow response. We can see this, there'll be high serum uh, ferritin levels, high iron levels, and the cobalamin and folate is going to be normal. We need to, again, correct the underlying cause, um, give erythropoietin, point, excuse me, give erythropoietin if needed, if we don't have that hormone um, circulating and especially if we have chronic kidney disease. And packed red blood cell transfusions. This can help these patients, of course. We want to treat that underlying condition, but in the acute time of anemia, we need to do, we still need to treat the anemia. Um, next, we're going to move on to aplastic anemia. And this is when we have peripheral blood pancytopenia. Can we, anyone remember what that pancytopenia meant when we went over those medical terms? So we're gonna have a decrease in all blood cell types. Remember, a decrease in red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Pancytopenia, so this is known as aplastic anemia. Um, this causes of aplastic anemia by chemical agents, insecticides, arsenic, alcohol. Um, Anti-seizure drugs can cause this, any antimicrobials, gold, antithyroid meds, allopurinol, immune suppression by stem cells. Um, typically what happens is our T cells are kind of reacting against our own stem cells, and this is typically the most common type of aplastic anemia. Inherited stem cell defect, um, any radiation or viral and bacterial infections. Um, this anemia can range from minor. Patients may need just blood transfusions or erythropoietin administration, or it can range from severe, causing fatal hemorrhaging and sepsis. So if you think about it, if we have a decrease in you know, all types of blood, we're going to have severe anemia. We're going to have probably severe infection if we don't have enough white blood cells. And we're going to probably have some hemorrhaging here if we don't have enough platelets. So think of everything that can happen in, you know, in turn of what's causing this aplastic anemia. <clears throat> so again, how patients will present, they're gonna have those general manifestations of anemia. So always go back to that slide. Neutropenic patients are of course susceptible to infection. They have the white, low white blood cells and sepsis. And if there's thrombocytopenia going on, meaning low platelets, patients are gonna be susceptible to bleeding. So we're gonna see a decrease H and H, we're gonna see a decrease white blood cell count, and we're gonna see decreased platelets. Bone marrow biopsies are often a great diagnostic tool along with labs. Um, we can see kind of what's you know going on within the bone marrow itself. And we're gonna see an increased yellow marrow um, in aplastic anemia. So nursing, definitely probably transfused packed red blood cells. We need to, you know, put back into the body what's missing. Transfusion of platelets. We don't want the patient to be bleeding out. Um, so that will help with the coagulopathies. We're going to provide supportive care for patients with low white blood cells. We're going to prevent infection to the best of our ability and maybe work with some immunosuppressive therapy for these patients. Steroid therapy can help make our patients a little bit stronger, decrease some inflammation. I know cyclosporine and anti-hymocyte um, fight 
evading T cells, especially if we have invading T cells affecting our bone marrow, um, that these medications can help with that. Also stem cell transplants, um, if, if this is a huge issue with these patients. If patients, just an FYI, if anyone is going for a stem cell transplant, if they have received prior blood transfusions, puts the patient at a little greater risk for rejection. And then we have acute blood loss anemia. Okay, so this is happening acutely, very quickly, rapid onset. We see this with acute hemorrhage, whether it be by trauma, um, a surgical complication, a pregnancy complication, anything that's causing hemorrhaging within the body. Um, also conditions or diseases that disrupt vascular integrity. And if, if we see this a lot with alcohol use disorder patients, the esophageal, esophageal varices and the huge amounts of hemorrhaging that goes on with the varices. Um, so what can lead to acute blood loss? We know this can be definitely hypovolemic shock, right? They're losing a lot of volume depending on how they're losing it. What's, how, are they, how are they hemorrhaging, okay? Um, assessing for pain or other signs is really important, especially if there's an internal hemorrhage and we can't visually see it on the outside. Um, a lot of hemorrhaging causes a lot of pain due to like the tissue distension, there's displacement um, due to the, you know, due to the hemorrhaging internal bleeding. There can even be nerve compression due to the internal bleeding. Um, there even may be retroperitoneal bleeding. So it's always important to look at your patient's body front and back, right? Inferior, posterior. We might actually see some bruising coming through where the flank area is if there is any retroperitoneal bleeding or hematoma or bruising in the flank. So symptoms kind of rise, of course, uh, the more percentage of blood we lose. So 500 mLs is about 10%, and patients maybe feel a little syncopal, right? They feel a little dizzy, lightheaded. About 1,000 mLs loss, that's about 20%, and we start to see some changes in our vital signs. So the patient starts to exhibit those signs of um, hypovolemic shock, tachycardic, slight hypotension, right? And then this just progresses worse um, as we go up. So 1,500 mLs lost, about 13%, continued tachycardia, um, and more exercise, more, um, excuse me, hypotension. Um, 2,000 mLs lost leads to 40%. And everything just continues to decrease. Decrease blood pressure. Um, rapid thready, tachycardic pulse. These patients at this point become cold and clammy. Um, air hunger, they're not having that good perfusion. And then if there's about 2,500 lost or 50%, we start to see really into shock, their acidotic, you know, potential death. Diagnostics, we're going to take a H and P. Where is the bleeding coming from? What is the underlying cause of the bleeding? <clears throat> we're going to see the decrease in H and H and probably a decrease in red blood cells. Again, where's the source of the bleeding? And we need to replace this volume quickly. We need to prevent shock. IV fluids can be given. Anything that can be given to plump up your um, vessels will be helpful. So normal saline or lactated ringers can be helpful and providing that um, plumpness to your vessels. Along with blood products, we can give packed red blood cells, transfusions. Albumin can even help. That's a protein that brings in fluid to your vasculature, helps increase your blood pressure. Platelets can help, fresh frozen plasma, cryoprecipitate. And next we're gonna talk about hemolytic anemia. And this is actually the third major cause of anemia. And what's going on here is we have an increased destruction of red blood cells, which will in turn cause, again, elevated bilirubin levels. Um, very similar <clears throat> to the um, thalassemia type. Um, so when the red blood cells are destroyed quickly and hemolysis happens, again, they're getting filtered through, you know, the liver, the spleen becomes enlarged, 
Um, and also this can lead to acute kidney injury as well because the accumulation of the large amounts of destroyed red blood cells kind of clog up the kidney tubules and renal tubules leading to uh, poor, you know, the kidneys will not be working as well, leading to AKI, acute kidney injury. So we have a destruction of red blood cells at a rate that exceeds production. And this can be either intrinsic or acquired. So intrinsic meaning this is a hereditary predisposition resulting from def defects in red blood cells themselves. <clears throat> and um, also acquired is a bit more common. Um, this is when the red blood cells are normal, but external factors cause damage like the macrophages there, this is kind of more of like a self attack as well. The macrophages come attack the red blood cells and then <clears throat> more issues result from there. Um, that's supposed to say liver, not live. So liver, spleen and bone marrow involvement, decrease in hem hemoglobin and hematocrit. If we were gonna take a look at a CBC and also we're gonna see an increase in bilirubin. Again, patients are gonna have general symptoms of anemia, just like most of our anemias we talked about. So going through all those same clinical manifestations, um, appearing jaundice, and of course, that is from the increased destruction and breakdown of red blood cells, making bilirubin levels rise. Um, patients probably will um, also have an enlarged spleen, also enlarged liver, again, due to to the accumulation of the breakdown of the red blood cell. And then also be aware of renal functions. Why? Because the accumulation of destructed red blood cell can um, clog up the kidneys and lead to acute kidney injury. All right, so those are all of our anemias. We're gonna get rid in, right into our blood transfusions. And But first, let's take a look at our blood components, what can be given via transfusion. Um, so the first one on the left is, of course, the packed red blood cell. Um, each packed red blood cell usually contains about 200 mLs of red blood cells, about 70 mLs of plasma, and 100 mLs of additive solution like a citrate, which is kind of keeps it to last. And also anticoagulants are in there so the blood doesn't clot, um, some dextrose. So a total um, will be about 300 ml in each bag. And about a unit can replace a blood loss of about 500 ml. <clears throat> On the right here is platelets. Um, they're commonly transfused to patients with low platelet counts or patients who have a platelet dysfunction or a patient who is hemorrhaging or bleeding, high risk for bleeding. Um, this can hopefully help kind of get the coagulation factors back to normal. Then on the left here again, we have fresh frozen plasma. Um, this is a blood product made from the liquid portion of whole blood. And this is used to treat conditions that, you know, have low blood clotting factors or low levels of other blood proteins. And it can also be used for as a replacement, you know, for in plasma exchange. And then on the right hand side, we have what's called cryoprecipitate or cryo for short. Um, it's a portion of plasma. It's actually, you know, in the liquid part of our blood. It's rich in clotting factors and also rich in proteins that can reduce blood loss. So it's going to help our slow bleeding. Um, we see a lot of fibrinogen in cryo. So these bags typically kind of look what are given today. Um, all bags are now barcoded and there's many scanning systems now for blood and we'll, we'll get into that in a second. So here's our blood compatibilities and we know this is really, really important um, to not give a patient incompatible blood, right? Because we can really do some damage and cause death um, or harm or death. So we can tell by this graph here that our universal donor looks like it is O negative. So O negative if, is our universal donor. And our universal receiver looks like it is AB positive. 
okay? So we can tell that by all the blood drops under the AB positive, you can receive, if you're AB positive, you can receive all the blood types at the top. And if you are O negative, you can give blood to all the types of blood on, around, on the side. <clears throat> so the lab does a great job at matching up compatibilities, making sure the patient has compatible blood. And leading to that, of course, a type and screen needs to be done prior to any transfusion. Um, this is called a type and screen or type and cross. Um, and again, a transfusion can't be done without this happening. Typically, as per BMC, different facilities may be different. Um, one type and screen per one admit is typically good. If the patient were to go home and come back, they would, of course, need a new type and screen needs to be redone. Um, it determines the ABO blood type of the patient. It will determine the RH blood type of the patient. Kind of looks at some antigens, RH blood groups. It also screens the patient for any non-ABO antibodies that might have developed. When we do a type and screen, um, this is a two nurse verification process. So um, the verifying nurse needs to be at the bedside while this type and screen is drawn to be made sure that it's done on the correct patient. It can very easily be mistaken for a different patient and you know that can that's where mistakes are made. So always have a verifying nurse come in with you to the room, watch you draw that blood, that it's from the correct patient, identify the patient, name, date of birth. And when this tube gets sent down, um, the two verifi verifying nurses um, need both their names. So their name, your name will be on there and your um, ID number. So employee ID for both verifying nurses. <clears throat> So the blood transfusion process, um, so first and foremost, IV access is important. Um, a 22 gauge is appropriate, but as we know for, we don't really know for gauges yet, that's in, that's in the next PowerPoint, but um, the lower the gauge goes, the larger the gauge, excuse me, the, lar the lower the number goes, the larger the gauge is. So 16 is definitely preferred, 18 is better, 22 is even appropriate to receive blood. But of course, the larger the bore, the better the infusion is, okay? Um, blood is only run with normal saline, nothing else, okay? Not lactated ringers, not dextrose, not D5, half, um, half normal saline, only normal saline, okay? Only normal saline. So only compatible, um, fluid with blood and we're going to prime that saline y tubing okay there's a y tubing i have pictures of the y tubing in a second and we're going to spike our normal saline bag and prime our tubing and we're going to attach it to our iv to our patient and we're going to run very slow and at the same time we're going to make sure our iv is working um, we do not want to run down to that blood bank and get a blood bag and come back and see that our IV is not working. So that's why it's always good before you get your blood to make sure that you have a running line, that it's not infiltrated, that it flushes well, and that it's working. So we're going to plug that into the patient and we're going to run that saline really, really slow, just a little trickle, just to keep the vein open while we're going to get our blood, okay? Um... Also, before we go down to get our blood at the blood bank, we need to make sure that consent is done. Is it in the chart? Is it dated appropriately? And is it signed by both provider and patient? Okay, this needs to be done too. So the two most important things is making sure that you have a running IV, you know, well for the blood and that you have consent in the chart before you go down. So that now that we have that both taken care of, we can run down to the blood bank. We're going to bring a patient sticker with us, and then we're going to go through the process of getting the blood. It's a whole scanning process down at the blood bank, too. They are well-oiled machine down there, and they know very well what we're, you're doing. Um, and you're going to be verifying the same thing, patient, date of birth, medical record number, and also making sure that the blood type matches the patient. 
Now that you have your blood, you have 15 minutes to hang that bag, okay? That bag, unspiked, is good for 15 minutes, all right? So that's why when you come back up to the floor and you don't, and you realize you don't have consent sign and you realize you don't have a running IV, you only have 15 minutes to get those things figured out. Um, so it's, everything's a timely process, you know, on a, on a very specific regimen here. Um, like I had mentioned, you know, a lot of facilities now use scanning and at BMC we call it the TAR, which is called Transfusion Administration Record. And that's our barcode scanning system of the blood bags. Um, due to the scanning system, BMC does not require you to have a two nurse verification for the blood. Some other hospitals still do even with the scanning. So BMC does not, um, I think Bay State still requires you to have a two nurse verification. So once everything's scanned through, you scanned your patient band, then you scan all the barcodes on the bag. And what you're scanning is you're scanning the barcode for the blood type. You're scanning a um, um, expiration date. You're scanning a unit number um, and a few other things and making sure everything matches correctly onto the TAR, just like you would with medications. With blood, you need pre-set of vital signs, and this is going to be your first set of vital signs, and this gives us a baseline to go off of, right? And especially when we're ruling out if, if God forbid, a transfusion reaction were to happen. So pre-set of vital signs needs to be placed into the tar and taken. And once we do that, we're good to now spike our blood bag and we can initiate our transfusion. <clears throat> so we're going to do kind of the same priming process, but with the blood, and the blood's going to kind of mix in with the normal saline and enter the patient. Once that blood has started entering the patient, um, we're going to stay with that patient for about 15 minutes. Um, at this time, you're kind of in educating the patient on any transfusion reactions that may occur, symptoms, and we're going to go over some signs and symptoms of those in a second. And Transfusion reactions usually occur within the first few 15 minutes, so that's why it's important to stay with your patient at that time. Once the 15 minutes is up, you, you can go do other work. Um, you can leave that blood running. Um, once that 15-minute period is done, we do need a 15-minute set of vital signs. So you get your initial, which is pre-vitals, then you get your 15-minute set of vital signs, and then if everything has gone okay, of course, we'll get the end set of vital signs. So three sets of vital signs while doing blood transfusions. Um, if we're hanging packed red blood cells, that max time of hanging is four hours. Minimum is typically about two. So you have a two to a four hour window. And that all depends on the patient. You know, typically more elderly patients who are more at risk for congestive heart failure or hanging onto fluids probably will need a little slower drip so they don't get too fluid overloaded um, or CHF patients. And then patients who can tolerate more fluid administration a little bit better, they can probably hang on for the two hour, two and a half hour window. So that you have to really know your patient and the history and that will kind of help you decide on how long to hang your blood over. But you have that time frame from two hours to four hours, whatever you think the patient will tolerate better. <clears throat> blood is hung by drip only. It is not put through a pump. Um, that is our BMC hospital policy. I know Bay State does put their blood through a pump. We do not at BMC. So please remember that and keep that in mind. Um, also, if patients on the seat, while we're talking about CHF and fluid overload, some patients may need a Lasix order, um, especially if they're getting two units. Um, they'll get a you know 40 a Lasix in between units to make sure that they're not holding onto the fluid and they're diuresing also. Um, or if they're just getting the one unit of blood, then they can receive the Lasix after when they're done with the transfusion. And what do we do if a transfusion reaction occurs? We're going to stop it, right? We're going to stop our transfusion um, immediately, and then um, we're going to go from there. And we'll talk about what we do in, in a few slides. So that is kind of the nitty gritty of how to do a blood transfusion. Um, I'm going to put up a video for you guys on just kind of priming and going over this again.
All right, so you're like, why tubing? What is that? So this, this is our example of why tubing. Um, as you can see on one side, we have our normal saline that is spiked, which is primed first. And then once all your things are done, then we spike our blood bag, we prime that and mix that through with the saline, and then that's given to the patient. So this is pretty much what you're, this is the setup here. Um, there's no, you know, we're not putting anything on a hanger, gravity hanger. We don't need to do that. And on the right hand side is another example of some Y tubing. Um, also, there's blood warmers. Um, some patients may need their blood warmed, and that's dependent on their IV um, access. Any patient who has a central line needs a blood warmer, okay? We can't administer blood, um, not through a blood warmer. If it's, say, it, this is going to be a PIC line, or if it's um, central line, it, it needs to be warmed. Um, the reason being is that our central lines are really directed directly to our heart, the super vena cava. And we can cause major, major heart irritation um, of or vas you know, vasospasms or spasms of the heart if that fluid is going in initially too cold. <clears throat> so at BMC, this is what we have for the blood warmer machine. This is on the left-hand side, it's green. So you'll see those around. And then what is placed in that slot is what you see here on the right hand side. So all this has to be placed in your blood warmer machine before priming. And what this does is this is a plastic sleeve and all this warms the fluid within the plastic sleeve. And when it exits the machine into the dropper here, um, it's gonna be warmed fluid. So central line, pick lines, you need a blood warmer. There are also some instances where we need a rapid transfuser. So these are patients who are requiring large amounts of blood, many, many blood bags. Um, a rapid transfuser can infuse a blood bag in about in a matter of 40 seconds, I believe. And then you just keep on adding blood bags, adding blood bags. Um, this warms it initially, so the, the rapid transfuser itself will warm the fluid no matter what. Um, it just goes in very, very, very fast. Talking about the Y tubing that we would use just for a normal transfusion, that tubing and, and bag setup, like normal saline setup, is only good for two packed red blood cells. So after you have hung two bags of packed red blood cells, you'll need to do a whole new setup. Um, and that's per policy as well. <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about um, blood transfusion reactions. So the first one is acute hemolytic reaction. Um, and like we said, the first thing we need to do is stop the infusion, right? We're gonna stop it. And this typically happens with an infusion of incompatible blood. Okay, our blood is incompatible for some reason. And this develops within the first 15 minutes. So we need to stop the infusion like we talked about. And we are, these patients typically present with either fever, with or without chills. They have some back pain going on, um, abdominal pain, chest pain, could have flank pain, tachycardia, shortness of breath and tachypnea. So increased respiratory rate, hypotension, and hemoglobinuria. So we'll see some of that destruction. So this is when we have a hemolytic reaction, it's actually destroying the red blood cells. So we're going to pick up that in the urine. We'll see some um, hemoglobin within the urine and due to the destruction. So we're going to stop our infusion. We're going to draw some blood samples for testing. On each blood bag comes with little peel off, actually pre-sealed blood pouches. Um, and you can actually just break them off. Um, they're almost like those like honey stick type of things. They look like that and they're hanging from the, the blood itself. That gets sent back down to the lab for further testing on the blood in case there was a problem with the blood itself. Um, 
We're also going to send a urine sample so we can pick up on that hemoglobinuria, the destruction of the red blood cells in the urine. And we're just going to, you know, treat and maintain the patient, maintain their blood pressure. Um, and typically, once we stop the infusion, we should really instill saline, get them normal saline wide open, flush the system. <clears throat> Next is a febrile non-hemolytic reaction. And we see this a lot with sensitization to donors, white blood cells. So there's a sensitization to the white blood cells in the bag. Again, we're gonna need to stop the infusion. Um, we're gonna note that the patient has had sudden chills, rigors, and fever. They may have a headache, vomiting. Um, we're really gonna need to give Tylenol. And for patients who have had a history of this or a known sensitization to white blood cells, um, the blood that they receive will be filtered or washed, meaning they're gonna have a reduced leukocyte um, in, the, in the blood product. Next is a mild allergic reaction. Um, and this is a patient's developed a sensitivity. So they feel like, you know, your body is saying, no, this is foreign, I don't want it. Um, typically it's the foreign plasma proteins. So they don't, it's not, you know, life threatening at this point, but the patient will develop, you know, some flushing, maybe some itching, some hives, and hopefully the transfusion can maybe get, you can finish the transfusion if you slow it down. It's all dependent on the provider. Does the provider want to totally stop the blood transfusion? Do they want you to slow it and treat the symptoms? <clears throat> so we can always give an antihistamine, we can give a corticosteroid, um, possible epinephrine if needed, um, Benadryl. And again, if symptoms are very mild and transient, you can most likely restart and slow the, slow the transfusion. And that's, again, all dependent on the provider. If any like pulmonary symptoms develop or more anaphylaxis or fever, that's another story. Um, that's when the transfusion will, of course, need to be stopped. And then we get into the most more severe. We have the anaphylactic and severe allergic reaction. And again, this is major sensitivity to the plasma proteins. Um, so stopping the infusion is very, very important. And our patients are going to really undergo impending doom, and they're going through a shocky state right now, so anaphylactic shock. They can get very tachycardic, hypotensive, develop wheezing and strider and bronchoconstriction and shortness of breath, um, bronchospasms even, and possible cardiac arrest. So we're going to want to really administer oxygen depending on the patient's requirements at that time. But your main medications or four main medications for anaphylaxis is the epinephrine. We're going to give the epi. We're going to give albuterol updraft. We're going to give a corticosteroid like a solumedrol. And we're going to give Benadryl. Next is dealing with circulatory overload. And this is when a patient is not tolerating the fluid given. Um, the fluid is given faster than the patient's circulation can handle. So we see this a lot in like renal insufficient patients, kidney disease, cardiac disease, or, you know, chronic CHF. <clears throat> so patients will develop that shortness of breath, will have some pulmonary congestion, will hear that crackling, adventitious breath sounds. Um, because of CHF, we'll see those distended neck veins and tachycardia because the heart's working hard. We're gonna place that patient upright, make sure they're getting the best oxygen and best, and they're in the best position possible for that, and obtain a chest X-ray, see how bad the pulmonary congestion is, and they're gonna need a diuretic of some sort. So that per prescriber provider is going to need to order um, some sort of diuretic, most likely Lasix, provide some oxygen, and sometimes morphine and administration can help with the work of breathing, offload the breathing a little bit. <clears throat> Depending on how severe the congestion is, we could possibly slow the transfusion, give diuretics intermittently throughout the transfusion, um, or we may need to hold off altogether. So again, that's dependent on the provider. Next, there is what's known as trolley or transfusion-related acute lung injury. So this is when there is a reaction between transfused anti-leukocyte antibodies and patients' leukocytes. 
So again, a reaction between the white blood cells, and this is gonna cause a pulmonary inflammation. It's actually gonna cause pulmonary edema. So when we have major inflammation going on, we're gonna have a major capillary leak, meaning that we're gonna have fluid exiting our vessels where we want our fluid to be, and it's gonna go, be going into a space that is not going to be helping us, meaning our lungs. Um, so we're going to have a major, major pulmonary edema issue going on due to capillary leaking due to the inflammation. We see this typically within one to six hours of infusion. And again, stop the transfusion immediately. The patient may present with more the pulmonary symptoms, acute respiratory failure, pulmonary edema, shortness of breath. We'll see that frothy sputum, um, you know, high respiratory rate and they'll develop the fevers, chills, and possible hypotension. <clears throat> Arterial blood gases are very helpful, um, especially if we're having the capillary leaking into our lung because we're gonna wanna see how our gas exchange is doing. So probably getting a set of ABGs would be great. Um, stat chest x-ray to see how bad the pulmonary congestion is. Oxygen administration or ventilatory support. And corticosteroids always help out our pulmonary patients a lot. And then lastly, there's the massive blood transfusion reaction. <clears throat> so this occurs when we are replacing large amounts of blood, um, typically 10 or more bags. Does this happen with every patient? No, I've been through many rapid transfusion protocols um, where I, I, haven't, I haven't seen this yet. Um, so I think it's pretty rare, um, but it can occur. So we see this within a 24-hour period of a patient getting multiple, multiple bags of blood. Um, so it's important to monitor, you know, any clotting statuses and electro electrolyte levels when they're receiving large amounts of blood like this. And what happens is because of the citrate, remember this is a storage solution. Um, it's kind of a preservative within our blood that they put in our blood, the citrate. Um, it can actually bind to calcium, um, which can cause a, a lot of issues here. So we can have a citrate toxicity because of how many bags they're getting. We can have cardiac dysrhythmias due to the binding of the calcium, hypocalcemia, um, hypothermia can occur. And that's why it's always important to use blood warming product, excuse me, blood warming equipment, um, like the blood warmer or the rapid transfuser. And I thank you very much for listening to me for this whole almost hour and 40 minutes. Um, I hope this is helpful. Please email me if you have any questions about this material. Um, I'm happy to help. Thank you.